In other words, yes, believe in Jesus and what he did for on the, on the cross, that's awesome, but now it's do, 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 do. You've got to do these things to be right with God and continue in your walk with God. Otherwise, you will lose your acceptance with God. And Paul says that is a load of garbage. That is a complete load of garbage. And he says to the Galatians, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I'd like to learn one thing from, from you. Did you, by receiving the Spirit by faith, are you planning on now continuing your journey by works? It's by faith. And now he goes on, he says, okay, here's how it works. In the fifth chapter, he's going to say, this is how you do this. It's not by works. It's not by a list of activities. It's not by a bunch of things you do. No, he says, walk by the Spirit. Galatians 2.20, he says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live through him. And now he's saying, this is how you do this. You walk by the Spirit. That phrase, walk by the Spirit, if you have an NIV, it'll say live by the Spirit. It can be translated either way. It implies both direction and empowerment. Walking by the Spirit means that the Spirit is guiding you in a particular direction. You're not aimless in your journey. There's a direction, and He's moving you towards that direction, but it also implies that it's empowerment. You're not walking by your own power. You yourself are choosing to walk in that direction, but it is a supernatural power. It's not from you. So it's supernaturally directed in terms of its direction and also its empowerment. And then take a look down at the bottom of the verse here, verse 18. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. To be led by the Spirit and to walk by the Spirit are really one and the same thing. It's the same way of saying, or it's a different way of saying the same thing. You walk by the Spirit. He directs you, empowers you, and guides you, and you're led by the Spirit. Now, led connotates a, a little bit different flavor and in terms of there's a willingness to be led by anybody or anything implies a willingness to submit to, uh, to the one doing the leading and allow that person to actually chart the course that you're going on. The, the word to lead in, in the Greek means to take from, to guide from one point to another, to walk alongside, or to, for a person to take one person from one point to another. So we're led by the Spirit in that sense. Now let's move ahead to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, a totally different book. Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus, and he's talking to them about, uh, well, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I'll, I'll back you up and give you some context here before I just drop verse 18 on you. Paul says in verse 1 of chapter 5, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Well, how do you do that, imitate God? I mean, come on, Really? Peter says, be holy. God says, be holy as I am holy, for no one sees the Lord without holiness. Oops. How do we do that? I'm not particularly holy in and of myself apart from Christ. In fact, Paul says, nothing good apart from Christ dwells within me. So how do you actually become holy when you are, in fact, not holy, except for the holiness of God, the the righteousness of Christ that's been imputed to us by faith? Paul says, therefore, be imitators of God, his beloved children, and walk in love. There's that phrase again, walk. It it implies direction. It implies empowerment. Walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. And he gives a whole bunch of things. Here's what it's not going to look like. Here's what it's going to look like. And then in verse 15, he says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. And then he says, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. But understand what the will of the Lord is. Okay, so what's the will of the Lord? Paul says, I want you to walk. I want you to be wise. I want you to be imitators of God. I want you to walk in love. Don't be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. So you're like, okay, get on with it. What is his will? Tell me already, what is his will? Tell me to walk. You tell me to love. You tell me not to be foolish. What do I do? Well, 
Don't get drunk with wine, first of all. That would be a dumb idea. For that leads to debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. I believe that it is not Paul's primarily, primary purpose here to talk about the effects of wine, but rather to talk about the effects of being filled with the Spirit, precisely because wine is a great illustrator for what the effects of the Spirit do to a person when that person is filled. Now, I'm not going to ask a show of hands for how many people have been drunk with wine, but I'm going to guess that probably many of you on one occasion or another or on a regular basis, unfortunately, for some of you, it's, it's a common occurrence. Or it's an occurrence that you've at least seen. You may have never been drunk yourself, but you've seen people who have been drunk with wine. Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, which is not the primary purpose of verse 18. The primary purpose of verse 18 is to explain what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Being drunk with wine, it's, you've heard the phrase, it means to be under the influence. You get pulled over and for drunk driving, you get a ticket for being under the influence and you go to jail. You are under the influence of the alcohol. In other words, you submit yourself to a foreign substance that you willingly put into your body, which does not make you stupid. It just simply reveals to the world that you are stupid. That's how alcohol works. When people drink and they start to get, they, what do they refer to it? I just need a drink. It loosens me up. What do people mean by that? They mean I need a drink to loosen me up so that I can say stuff that I wish I had the courage to say when I was sober. The alcohol does not put the thoughts into your mind. It simply gives you the, the release and the quote-unquote, I'm going to use quotations here, freedom. It's not freedom, but it gives you the freedom to act out in your sin nature, what you would do, but you're too sensible to do when you're sober. Does that make sense? That's why it always leads to debauchery. Guys grow beer muscles when they drink. They don't have muscles. They just think they have muscles. Now all of a sudden they want to fight the world. And, and people say things. They provoke fights. Stuff that they think about when they're sober. You know, I'd really like to say this to that guy, but, you know, I'm too civilized to say it. Start having a few beers, maybe a few cocktails, and the tongue is loosened. I'm going to say that. And you just say it. And somehow, that's a good thing. It's not a good thing. It leads to debauchery. It leads to debauchery. But the purpose here of using that as an illustration, because it perfectly illustrates in an opposite way of what being the filled with the Spirit does. But he says, don't be drunk with wine. Don't be under the influence of wine. That leads to debauchery. But instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, first of all, you cannot be filled with anything unless you are first emptied. That's why brokenness is a prerequisite to being filled with the Spirit. You can't be filled with the Spirit if you are content to lead and guide yourself and you're not yielded and submissive to the Lord. There's nothing to pour into. It's like this glass here. It's half full of water. If I want to pour water in here, I can only get this much in here. If I fill this full of, 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 of gravel or any substance, and I, I can only get enough water in there to displace what part isn't covered, the only way to be filled with the Spirit is, first of all, to be broken in the sense that we are emptied of ourselves. We are poured out. Then we can be filled. Then we can be filled. And then when we are filled with the Spirit, then when we are filled with the Spirit, which is the equivalent, Paul is using the same, different terminology to, to, to communicate the same thing, to walk by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit. These are all the same things that Paul is talking about. These are not three separate things. They're, this, this, they're the same thing, different ways of saying the same thing. To be filled with the Spirit means to, to have Christ indwell you and empower you. And now, to be drunk with wine means that you set loose your sin nature, which you've always had, to, to dominate and to show the world what's really inside of you. But when you're filled with the Spirit, the exact opposite 